Yeah, I mean, Jameis did not play very much last season. He was 5-2 and two in the games that he started. Um, he, was, he was very good, but definitely a different version of Jameis Williams is what we saw last season. Only 161 passing attempts in those seven games, 14 touchdowns, three interceptions. I don't really think that's like the optimal way to use him, though. I mean, to me, I you know, if I if I was calling the plays, I would uh, I'd be calling them like Jameis's final season in Tampa Bay when he had fifty two hundred passing yards, thirty three touchdowns, and thirty interceptions. Because in in my mind, you know, you can kind of live with the interceptions when you are you know a top five offense in football. But we'll see. I mean, maybe a marriage of those two things is kind of what the Saints coaching staff wants to do with him I also you know I I do wonder what their plans are with Taysom Hill I mean he is uh he's making 16 million dollars a year um you know I just I I wonder if there's like a rotation or if Taysom's getting some of these wildcat snaps and I I really liked what they did with their wide receiver grouping they probably had the worst wide receivers in football last season they get Michael Thomas back they signed Jarvis Landry I honestly I think Jarvis Landry is kind of the Michael Thomas insurance where if Thomas is not able to play Landry's going to be there in the slot and they drafted I mean some people thought Chris Olave was the best wide receiver in the NFL draft mm-hmm. and and also looks like the Saints are going to get lucky with Alvin Kamara not being suspended to start the year uh wonder if he actually ends up getting suspended next year but he got in this uh, you know this assault trial he got his trial date pushed back I think three months so I, I, but I think we just don't know, right? I mean, we just really don't really know what the Saints are going to look like. So I think they're one of the more interesting teams to think about preseason. Yeah, I, I think that this is a team where the range of outcomes vary significantly. Like if you told me at the end of the season, the Saints won 12 games, I would be very surprised, but I could see it. If you said to me the Saints win four games, I'd probably be a little surprised, but I also could see it, which is why I'm, I am, I guess, most surprised on this team, Davis, that when the Sean Payton era ended and the Drew Brees era ended and Michael Thomas basically hasn't played and they had these issues with Kamara, I'm a little surprised that they didn't tear it down. I am. I'm surprised that they didn't just say, hey, step back. Let's get our quarterback of the future is what teams do in the NFL. But instead, they kind of like, let's put some duct tape over this for like a year. And that's the way I see the Saints this year. That's kind of my view on it. I think, I mean, I, I definitely think James Winston, obviously, not as good as Drew Brees, but they they looked at their cap situation and how many first-round picks they traded away, and they're like, we can't be bad, right? We just cannot afford to be bad. We got to try and win. Ten games is really what they decided. Well, we'll see what ends up happening. Not the toughest division in football either to compete, so we'll see how that ends up working out. But up next, it's our final look at the New Orleans Saints in the NFFC. We'll go through their average draft position if you have a draft coming up tonight or tomorrow. It certainly will help you as our Saints previews up next right here on Fantasy Sports Today. The early line. That MVP mm. award here at 14 to 1. He's in one of those spaces where if Russell Wilson just stayed in Seattle, yeah, it's Russ, he dominates. What do you want from him? But if he moves over to the Denver Broncos and they win the AFC West, and Russell Wilson is the reason that you're going to win the AFC West, I think you get a little bit more points on the bulletin board in order to get that done. So I like that 14 to 1 as well. There's a lot to like about Russell Wilson. We're expecting big things here, and I think he does some damage in some of those props. Only on Sports Grid. Pharrell, coast to coast. In fact, if you said to me, give me your top three teams you like to beat the odds. Phillies won, the Panthers are two at six and a half, and I'm going to shock you with this one. I still like the Jets over five and a half. I know that their schedule is really tough to start. Last time I checked, it's a 17-game season, folks. Don't overreact to early season schedules. They've upgraded severely that roster. They will absolutely be better than five and a half wins. The Sports Grid Network. 
in game live. They're going to get Alvin Kamara for the entirety of the season. No suspension. They get Michael Thomas back a wide receiver who didn't play last year. They have Chris Olave. And I think you have to feel very confident about them not just making the playoffs, but winning this division. I would also look at the success that the Saints had last year. You might say that the Bucks should be the favorite, but from a betting standpoint, there are so many reasons why you should invest in the New Orleans Saints. Catch the program every single day on the Sports Grid Network. I don't know how it's going to work out for him, but I just don't see him being on the field nearly as much as he was last season. Maybe the touchdown numbers will have him in that tight end one category. Earlier in his career, he would have gotten that. I mean, I guess he had 108 rushing yards, but six rushing touchdowns in his career. So it doesn't give you any upside there. Carr, to be honest, for me, just is not a guy I ever end up targeting. Fantasy Sports Today, only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Rogers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell, coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley comes over there. Give me the game pass. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live all like access. Mandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game oh, live win. prime oh, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yeah. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. Welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today. Today on the show, we're previewing the New Orleans Saints from a fantasy football perspective. Of course, fantasy football season is coming fast and furious. The Saints, of course, play this weekend. So still some time to make your decision on drafting them. Most people will have their fantasy drafts, of course, before Thursday night. I guess there are some stragglers who will have it after Thursday. So we'll continue our team previews right up until Thursday night. Uh, Let's go through the ADP, the average draft position in the NFFC, National Fantasy Football Championships of the New Orleans Saints. Let's start off with the quarterback, Jameis Winston. We'll discuss him, I'm sure. And his ADP right now is around 15th, 16th round in fantasy football, followed by Alvin Kamara, who's essentially a late first, second round pick. Mark Ingram is back for another run, almost undrafted. Michael Thomas is a middle round pick. Chris Olave and then Jarvis Landry has returned to Louisiana. And he's going to play now for the New Orleans Saints after many years in Cleveland and then Miami. But uh, Davis, naturally, this is all going to run based on Jameis Winston. It's sort of interesting, that dynamic that you painted there, which is kind of true. If you're not going to be great, you may as well let him sling it. And, and inevitably, Davis, maybe that ends up happening. Maybe maybe the beginning of the season is more of what we saw from Winston last year, where it's like this ball control type offense. I know he did have that one game where I believe he threw five touchdowns and no interceptions, but the numbers after that were, were pretty pedestrian. And, and listen, it is true. A lot of people point to the Saints record. When he was at quarterback, they were pretty good. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to see. A lot of ranges of outcomes, I think, for him as well, but essentially not a starter in fantasy to open the season. Yeah, he, he started out the season throwing 20 passes against the Green Bay Packers, five of those going for a touchdown. He had a four-touchdown game against the Washington football team, but uh, only got over 30, 30 passing attempts in one game. It was a 13-10 to 10 win against Seattle. However, if you go back and look at the 2019 Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I mean, they just had fantasy guys left, right, and center, right? So Chris Godwin had 86 receptions, 1,400 yards, nine touchdowns, 1,000-yard season for Mike Evans. Mike Evans got hurt. Rashad Perryman was a fantasy starter with six touchdowns. Cameron Brait was a fantasy starter that season. Ronald Jones and Peyton Barber were fantasy starters. That's like he – Jameis Winston can clearly sustain a very fantasy-friendly offense. It's really just a question of do the New Orleans Saints want – to play that way. The Saints defense was very good last season, and they definitely did kind of transition into more of a ground and pound ball control style team, a team that, you know, for for the Saints, like we're very unfamiliar with that. 
when you think about the New Orleans Saints, you think about, you know, Devery Henderson and, and uh, Pierre Thomas and just like all, you know, I mean, how many guys have we picked up for the New Orleans Saints as a wide receiver for fantasy and then dropped them and like, you know, they're kind of just one of the all-time teams that way. They have four tight ends at any given time. I hope that they let Jameis, you know, kind of throw the rock around the yard because more fantasy-friendly offenses are good. However, my anticipation would be is that is not their plan. I think heading into the season, they're going to play like Jameis Winston is just a more capable version of Taysom Hill. They're going to run the ball a lot, taking the play clock down to zero, you know, throwing in the slot a lot to Michael Thomas and Jarvis Landry. So I, I'm not drafting Jameis as a fantasy starter, but it absolutely would not surprise me if things go south a little bit, if he does end up as a fantasy starter. Yeah, that would really be the key, is if they find themselves out of it uh, to potentially give them the shot. They don't have a great backup either, so it's it's pretty much caution to the wind. Uh, so Alvin Kamara this year, Davis, this is as low as I've seen him drafted in a few years, especially even in the draft that I did last night. Uh, you know, he's still very high pick, still like late first round, but he was top five, felt like, for the last few years. And I know he had that suspension sort of looming, and the numbers were, were definitely down last year from where they were. I guess the question is, uh, with, with his volume, is this like a bounce back type season for him? Or do you think that it's just time where eventually, you know, running backs get older and they start to fade a little bit? No, nah, for me, I, I think he is a total smash. I think the only reason he's not a top five pick is basically inertia. You know, all off season, he was a third round pick, then a second round pick. And then you get into the range where he's going next to Joe Mixon and Najee Harris and DeAndre Swift and Derrick Henry. And that inertia kind of slows down his rise a little bit. But he actually, last season, in only 13 games, the most carries he's ever got in a season, 240 carries, and he had 67 targets through 13 games. And remember, you know, he played some of these games with Trevor Simeon and Ian Book and Taysom Hill. Like, it was not a pretty situation at quarterback for the Saints. I I mean, I think he seems like one of the, probably the best value in the second round of drafts. Because if I tell you that Alvin Kamara has 280 carries and 120 targets, I mean, that is like, almost CMC level in terms of how good he would be for fantasy. And I actually think Alvin Kamara is even better than CMC in terms of what he can do after the catch. You know, CMC is a better, I think like a better route runner. Uh, His catch rate has been higher, but Kamara is one of the most dangerous players in NFL history once he gets the balls in his hand. So I I think, I mean, I'm expecting a top five fantasy season from Kamara. All right. Well, uh, always waiting in the wings is another running back. The Saints have tended to use two at different times, kind of similar to Baltimore situation to a degree. And speaking of that, Mark Ingram Davis is back for another run. Everyone thought his career was over last year, but he actually looked okay when he played. And he's basically not being drafted or just out, just inside the top 200. And I, I suppose... Uh, you know, with no Taysom Hill at quarterback, you know, goal line carries now could go to another running back. I believe Murray was there last year, Latavius. I think Latavius Murray was there last year. Um, but anyway, in- Ingram is more of just like a-, a strict league where there's non-PPR. I cannot imagine in a PPR league you would play Ingram, but it's sort of remarkable that he's still playing in the NFL. I mean, what a weird season for him last year. Starts out the year on the Houston Texans roster, 26 carries, 85 yards, and a touchdown in the first game of the season for the Houston Texans, then gets cut from the Houston Texans, goes to New Orleans, plays uh, in his very first game back in New Orleans, plays 29% of the snaps, gets two targets. Next game, plays 34% of the snaps, gets targeted five times. Then Alvin Kamari gets injured. He plays 85% of the snaps with 14 carries, seven targets. The next game, Kamara's out again, 16 carries and eight targets. I mean, he was just the workhorse running back, you know. They didn't hand it to Tony Jones. They didn't hand it to Ty Montgomery. Ty Montgomery, now a member of the New England Patriots. I, If Ingram is like can be out there, you know, if his body does not completely give up on him, he seems like one of the better handcuff running backs to own in fantasy football. Like real, like what is really the difference between him and Alexander Madison, right? Madison, you're never starting him when cook is active Ingram. You're never starting him when Kamara is active, but I would imagine, you know, if if I was working on our projections over at daily Roto and I knew that Kamara was going to be out, I mean, I would give Mark Ingram 14 to 18 carries and four to six targets. Like, he would have a really good role in that offense. So I, I actually do think he's probably being a little underdrafted because they don't have anyone behind him. 
Yeah, I guess that was my question. Is like, like, who is the number three Davis? Is is there anyone recognizable and any name at all? It's, I mean, it's the same guys that they had last season. It's Tony Jones Jr. who went to Northwestern, and it's Dwayne Washington who has been on the New Orleans Saints forever. I mean, I, I he got drafted in 2017. He has been on the New Orleans Saints that long, and he, uh, what you would most remember Dwayne Washington for is he is always the guy who comes in the final game of the season for the Saints and gets all their rushing attempts when the in week 17, week 18 when it doesn't matter. He's had two 100-yard rushing games in the last week of the season before, but, I mean, he, he's not going to get used. All right, so there you go. That's our look at the quarterbacks and running backs. Now, coming up next, we'll dive into some of the receivers and tight ends on the New Orleans Saints. By the way, if you missed any of our team previews at all this preseason, you can head on over to our YouTube page or also over at sportsgrid.com where we're archiving and reviewing every single team throughout the upcoming season and giving you an edge as to who potentially you may be taking in your fantasy football draft. I know a lot of you have probably drafted by now, but I'm guessing that there are some people will have drafts tonight. Some people will draft uh, tomorrow night. If you're drafting after Thursday, I'm not sure what you were waiting for, but I know there are a lot of people out there too that'll actually do it on Thursday night when the NFL games begin. All right, we'll take a quick time out here on the show. More Saints preview coming up next than Fantasy or Reality and the Sports Grid 60 here on this Tuesday edition of Fantasy Sports Today. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back right after these quick messages here on Sports Grid. Don't go away. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College and football the today. Of Alabama in winning SEC champions. It's the island of misfit tours. Fantasy sports so, today. You have to understand that. Can they survive those first four games? Think of two and two Pro two football two. today. This franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injury. This is a brutal rash. In-game live you can all take the access. You can take the money line. And the sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In I'm game live, prime time. I'm going a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international, Jason Day and Sergio Garcia. Well, boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge only on Sports Grid, your 24/7 sports wagering network. In game line. Chiefs can win that division. Broncos can win that division. Chargers can win the division. And I got to say something, Harrison. Raiders look good to me. That's the whole thing. Everybody's good there. Who has the best schedule is clearly the Broncos. Only the Broncos are getting the Jets, my friend. Oh, not, not the Chiefs, not the Raiders. And so then I looked at week 18. They get the home field game against the Chargers. And I said, and right now, I got him at plus 275. I had to roll with the Broncos to win that division. Catch the program every single day and on the Sports Grid Network. Fantasy sports today. When you're looking at Kyle Pitts. You're looking at a generational special talent. You're looking at a tight end who he had 110 targets last year. Don't you think if he gets 115 this year or 120, he's probably going to catch closer to 80 in year two and probably not have the one touchdown. He was still tight end seven last year in standard leagues, and he was tight end five in half PPR. Kyle Pitts is a player, Matt, that I think people don't quite understand exactly yet how special he is. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. There are some teams, Scott, that rely solely on analytics. There are some teams that are behind in analytics and rely a lot more on scouting. And then there are the Dodgers who really have that combination going. They've really figured out how to maximize every plate appearance. I don't see the Mets beating them. I don't care if they have four DeGroms. I, I think the Dodgers are going to the World Series. The Sports Grid Network.
We're reviewing the New Orleans Saints from a fantasy football perspective here on Fantasy Sports Today. For those of you who have an upcoming draft in fantasy football, the average draft position of the Saints is a little bit dicey as compared to where it was in years past. Michael Thomas approximately going in the eighth round. You have a rookie in Chris Olave. No one really uh, quite sure what to expect there. Of course, Jarvis Landry is in the mix there. And then Taysom Hill goes back from quarterback to uh, tight end. So we'll dive into this a little bit more. But naturally, the lightning rod conversation, Davis, here is is all about Michael Thomas. And it, it's sort of fascinating because when you think about it, I, I think that if we would have predicted a year ago or a year and a half ago or even nine months from now, would Michael Thomas be on the Saints this season? We I think we would have said no, like unequivocally. But somehow, credit to the Saints, they were able to sort of figure out how to get him in a good headspace, get him healthy, and get him back on the team. Uh, he was a top three pick a couple of years ago. Will he come anywhere close to that this year? I mean, you do have to feel like if he plays 17 games, he's probably going to be one of the bigger values in fantasy football. We have not seen him on a football field since 2020. And even in that season, he wasn't he wasn't great. You know, he had scored zero touchdowns. He had 55 targets through seven games, just kind of hobbling around on that ankle, just never really looked like Michael Thomas. And, you know, again, it's it's been a long time, so people forget. You know, for example, his 2019 season led the NFL in receptions, led the NFL in yards. He had 1,800 receiving yards and 149 receptions. I mean, really unbelievable led the nfl in receptions the year before now obviously this is probably going to be a little bit of a lower volume offense we talked about this already Jameis winston is not drew Brees. i don't think the new orleans saints plan is to is to run the tampa bay offense right airing it out i i mean i do kind of wonder if they would be effective with that i mean i think alave is great michael thomas is great jarvis landry certainly is better than the third mm-hmm. wide receivers that the saints have had in the past Alvin Kamara, one of the best receiving backs in the NFL. But what's really interesting about this whole discussion is this was maybe the worst wide receiver group in the NFL last season. They had one player with more than 500 receiving yards. That was Marquez Callaway, who was, you know, he got pushed all the way up in drafts after Michael Thomas was out for the season. He had six touchdowns. Alvin Kamara in 13 games was third on the team in receiving. We had Traquan Smith, Lil Jordan Humphrey, Juwan Johnson, Ty Montgomery, Kenny Still. I mean, just a rotating cast of characters, and they all stunk, right? They they it just no Saint, really no Saint was a good pick in fantasy last year. And I can't really remember the last time you would have said that. Yeah, Callaway was somebody I remember. I think I had him on one of my teams last year. Wide receiver three. It did not go well. All right, so Olave was a high pick for the Saints as well. And so I think that you said it best. It's like he's sort of a fail safe in case Thomas uh, is not back to who he was. And then you just play, uh, you know, Olave and Jarvis Landry. I think you kind of know who Landry is, but you're right. Olave was really good in college, played at a high level for many years. And, you know, with a, with a new quarterback next year or a Winston that was throwing like he was in Tampa Bay, he'd be supremely valuable at fantasy drafts, but he's, he's not being drafted like it right now with an ADP somewhere around the, I don't know, 10th, 11th round. Yeah, I mean, I I love rookie wide receivers. Like the the fantasy football market has gotten so efficient the last two years. You know, there's so much good content. People know what they're doing. You know, I'm in my my home league draft, and these these guys who use you know would have taken Ezekiel Elliott around ahead of ADP and Josh Jacobs and Antonio. Like you know, these these guys they've all learned, right? It's like you got to have six good wide receivers, or your fantasy football team is not going to be any good. And, uh, you know, you kind of rue the day. You kind of wish that you could still get someone like Alave in the 14th round. I mean, I remember Justin Jefferson was like a last mm-hmm. round pick, you know, his his rookie year. People dropped him after he started out the year playing behind Ola B.C. Johnson. That is totally gone, right? Traylon Burks, bad offseason, top 100 pick. Chris Alave playing with Michael Thomas and Jarvis Landry, pretty close to a top 100 pick. Jahan, you know, Jahan Dotson, Garrett Wilson, like, People just know to take these guys because they don't know, you know, we don't know which one is going to be great. You know, I don't, I don't know if Chris Olave is going to be great in the NFL. I don't know if Burks is going to be great, but history and, and probability suggests that, you know, two of these guys are going to be really good and probably very usable in fantasy as a rookie. And the thing that I think is going to help Olave out is Michael Thomas and Jarvis Landry are best out of the slot and they're best close to the line of scrimmage. Olave played purely as a perimeter wide receiver at Ohio State. 
Uh, you know, he can beat whoever he needs to beat. He can play in the slot if you ask him to. And I, I actually wonder if he is the best fit for Tampa Jameis, you know, the, 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 the let it fly version of Jameis, because the other outside wide receivers they have, Marcus Callaway, Traquan Smith, Deion Hardy, like the, these guys are are very tertiary NFL players. So I, I Olave is probably my favorite Saint player to draft at cost. All right. And uh, and on to Jarvis Landry we go, who obviously is now in his third team, Miami, Cleveland, and now uh, ends up here in New Orleans, which he remember he went to college at LSU. I think there was you know, partially the reason why he ended up here. But Landry's clearly, uh, Davis, not the guy he was five, six years ago, that's for sure. But in an offense that plays a little bit more control in terms of PPR, Saints have had those guys before that run over the middle, turn around and catch the ball. And I, and I feel like Landry's going to be a part of that this year. Yeah, I mean, like like I said, I mean, I do feel like Landry is is honestly probably just like, it, it's almost kind of like a handcuff situation. You know, you draft Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison, you draft Michael Thomas and Jarvis Landry. Landry has only ever played out of the slot. He's entering into his age 30 season. This is his uh, his ninth year in the NFL. He had, you know, he, he had a, he actually led the NFL in receptions, funnily enough, led the NFL in receptions the two years before Michael Thomas led the NFL in receptions. So the 2018, 2019, or the 2017, 2018, 2019 NFL leaders in receptions are all on the New Orleans Saints roster. And probably these three guys can all be out there together, Thomas, Landry, and Alave. But I do wonder if at the beginning of the year, if Michael Thomas is healthy, if Landry is actually the one losing snaps to Callaway, to Hardy, to Traquan Smith, because those guys are, are going to kind of clear out for Michael Thomas so he can do, him and Alvin Kamara can do their thing um, underneath. So not not really into Landry. I mean, he, he's going to play and he will have, a, you know, he will definitely have a couple games. Landry always does this where like, oh, he got 13 targets and two rushing right. attempts in this game because that the team just needed him that week. Um, so I think a shrewd free agent signing by the Saints, but not a guy I love for fantasy. All right, and then let's uh, cap it off with a tight end position where it looks like Taysom Hill is headed back there, running back, quarterback, tight end. Uh, you know, honestly, one of the more bizarre stories over the last couple of years in the NFL. We know how much Sean Payton liked him clearly enough to convince, uh, you know, their, their general manager, I guess, and ownership to give him a pretty big extension. Uh, but quarterback did not work out, Davis, and then Sean Payton just, like, leaves, and now the Saints are stuck with Taysom Hill, and he's a and he's a fun player, like he's fun to watch, and and he does a lot of different things. But I mean, I, I'm gonna guess he's the highest paid tight end in the NFL or close to it. With with based on the extension that he got, I, I just don't really know what to even expect of him. And then we had that controversy where does he qualify as a quarterback? Does he qualify as a tight end? So uh, sort of just a weird weird situation all around with Hill. And I'm guessing this will be his last year in New Orleans. Yeah, Taysom makes more money than Hunter Henry more money than Darren Waller, more money than Zach Ertz, Tyler Higby, uh, you know, TJ Hawkinson, right? A, a lot of these guys, which you, you definitely would not think. Um, he counted $22 million against the cap last year, $28 million against the cap this year. Uh, his cap his cap hit is in the mid, you know, 14, 15, 16 million over the next couple of years. However, I actually think this is a much better role for him than starting quarterback, right? Or backup quarterback or whatever, you know, a role where he can get some carries, he can get some targets, they can bring him in on some wildcat quarterback snaps, he can throw it. Like, I, I'm not opposed to the idea of Taysom Hill. What, what would always make you so angry, though, would be when Drew Brees was the quarterback and then Taysom would come in in these red right. zone packages or whatever, right? It's like, it's like uh, you know, in the Super Bowl, Andy Reid pulls Patrick Mahomes out there and has Blake Bell throw a pass in the Super Bowl, right? People forget that happened. It happened. Um, but when your quarterback's Jameis Winston, much different value proposition, right? Because True. then you're just trying to score points. You're just trying to scrape by. You're not saying, like, we have this legendary Hall of Fame quarterback we're taking off the field. We're, we're pulling out Jameis Winston, and we're going to let Jameis – or we're going to let Taysom do his thing. The other thing I would say – is leagues where Taysom is eligible at tight end. It's not an all software. Um, like, for example, he is on Yahoo, but on ESPN, he's a quarterback. And so it totally depends on, on where you play. But in leagues where he is eligible as a tight end, you got to be really paying close attention to 
is he get taking more quarterback snaps? Is Andy Dalton injured or whatever? Because I, right. I will I will guarantee this. Any week where Taysom gets a start at quarterback or or plays half the snaps at quarterback, whatever, he's gonna be the number one tight end. So you really gotta be paying attention to that because like for let's say week 17 against the Eagles, Jameis and Dalton are both hurt. Like you're gonna lose your fantasy championship because you were last to the waiver wire for Taysom Hill, pretty much, because he's scoring 20 points. I, I think the stat is that he's only ever had less than 20 points in a start at quarterback twice. And it's just because he run. I mean, he is one of the best rushing quarterbacks in the league. So you got to, got to, got to be monitoring Taysom this year. Yeah. Interesting from a fantasy uh, angle there to play him at different positions. All right. So you mentioned uh, Callaway before and, and yeah, that was a bust in terms of last year. I cannot believe Traquan Smith is back on New Orleans again. I did not even know that. Is there anyone, is there anyone else real quick that we should be focused on late? So this guy, Dion Hardy, is like one of the fastest wide receivers in the NFL. And I wonder if he is just better than Jarvis Landry and the rest of those guys. Like, I wonder if he just plays his way onto the field. Okay. A name to keep an eye on as we continue on here on Fantasy Sports Today. Up next, it is time for Fantasy or Reality. And then we've got these four grid 60s. So our team previews continue tomorrow here on FSP. Go so the way. might be the next daily fantasy millionaire no matter what you watch or where you play learn from the world's best dfs players lineup building tools expert projections and advanced stats change the way you play the game dominate the competition dailyroto.com the player's choice Fantasy Sports Today. Her cousins threw for 4,000 yards last year, 33 touchdowns. Essentially, he is a fantastic super flex quarterback. To have him as your number one super flex is fantastic. Do you see any drop back for him? I mean, Kirk Cousins has been a very good fantasy quarterback. I, I don't know if I would draft Cousins as a starter simply because I want to have a guy who can run, but I think he's a good option. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. There are four of the five teams in the American League East in contention for American League playoff spots at the moment. And it's not the Red Sox, as we all assumed it would be entering the season. It's the Baltimore Orioles. Because when was the last time we could say the O's were even in postseason contention? At this time, to start off the month of September, the Baltimore just keeps sticking around, keeps winning baseball games. And the Baltimore Orioles have been incredible. The Sports Grid Network. A-Rod, Clemens, Pettit, Bonds, McGuire, Sosa. Get ready, because that soup is served ice cold. From a betting perspective for the 2022 NFL season, if I'm betting on the 49ers in the futures market, I want Jimmy G on this roster because that instantly becomes one of the best backups he's taken to the Niners to the Super Bowl. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on SportsGrid. Sports professor Rick Harrow inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your Sports News Minute. Scene shifts to the West Coast with a joint venture that will benefit Sacramento. Sacramento Kings, Sacramento River Cats joining forces to take advantage of the synergies in sports marketing in that community. The Savage family, a very successful entrepreneurial group that created a ballpark in Sacramento that helped downtown development. And Vivek Ranadive, the owner of the Sacramento Kings, certainly has generated significant support. Remember when they were the Kansas City Omaha Kings and then the Kansas City Kings went to Sacramento, questionable possibilities. They've succeeded as much in the market, not necessarily on the floor. But the bottom line is both companies bring their assets to the state capital. And with gambling soon to be approved, the sky is the limit for a city that has a major league team and one that acts like one as well. Sports Professor Riccaro, Sports News Minute.
Our coverage of week one of the NFL continues here on this show, of course, but you'll want to follow us this week on social media for all of our fun content from our hosts and giving opinions and picks here on the show and some of our other sports wagering programs at SportsGrid, at SportsGrid TV. Make sure you are following us there. Of course, we have some great weekend programming, no doubt. And Davis, we have the opening up of the NFL season on Thursday. Are you done drafting? Are you finished, completed? Is everything done? All your teams ready to go? Nope. I actually, right after we get off here about an hour, I have one final FFPC main event draft, $2,000 entry, million dollars to first place. For, for that, I got one more of those. And I will probably be drafting best ball teams up until you know the kickoff, right? Because... It's what I've been telling people like the last like 10 days or so is like, don't get lazy now. You know, we, we've grinded this hard. We've done all these teams like just it sucks. You know, I'm, I'm drafting last night. I'm, I'm sitting there in, in the living room and I'm like, I just don't care anymore. Like I just, you know, I'm, uh, I'm taking Rashad White one more time. You know, and it's like I it's it's I, I am done. I, I am definitely burnt out on drafting at this point. You. But, you know, don't don't get lazy now. Yeah, well, I mean, my big draft was last night, too. So I was like, I texted you. I'm all about it. I'm like looking at guys that are left. I'm like, who is this, who is this guy likely on the Ravens? Who's Wandale Robinson? This guy seems like he may play. You know, going through every single guy at the end is always fun. Seeing the reactions of people in the draft that, that I'm with, like, who's that guy? You know, always fun. All right, let's, uh, let's kick it with a little fantasy or reality. Well, Davis, we've had week zero of college football and now week one of college football. And this weekend we get college and pro. Of course, we'll have the NFL start Thursday. We have college football Friday, Saturday, and the NFL on Sunday. And usually for a lot of people, they have to make a choice. It's true, especially for people like us now, Davis, who are married. You really don't get to sit in front of that TV two days in a row. At least I know that I don't. So you got to make a choice. And some people choose Saturday. Some people choose Sunday. Just depends on who you are. Fantasy reality, Davis. We will pose the question to you to start. College football Saturdays are more fun than NFL Sundays. Is this fantasy or reality? Yeah, this is this is a fantasy. Like, no way. I mean, if if college football fantasy was as big as NFL fantasy, you know, if I had 500 college football best ball teams and you know, you like the you could get as much action in DFS as you could. Then, then maybe it would be close. I, I think the the thing that is different about college football it's like you're literally doing it all day. Like you're doing, you, like you are, you're watching the Thursday night game, you're watching the Friday night game. You're you start at eleven on Saturday, and if you're if you're watching the Hawaii game, like if you watch the Hawaii game, you can be watching football until two in the morning. What I would say though is when you are a, a young married person without children, such as myself, you can pull this maneuver, which is the, oh, you know, let's go, let's go to brunch, right? Let's go to brunch. Let's go to a bar. Let's hang out, you know, with the friends and everything. And then what, what is the, what does the bar have on? What do they have on at brunch? You know, they have uh, Northwestern and Ohio state. They have uh, Oklahoma Texas. Like that's the move you got to do because you're right. You can't get two days in front of the TV. So you gotta, you gotta work out another way. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go the opposite here. I'm going to say reality. It's more fun for a lot of different reasons. For me, number number one is because I root for a team. This is the this is really the only time during the football season where I really care. Now, a lot of people bet, and of course, naturally, the team that you bet on, that's who you're rooting for. Your fantasy football team, the players, that's who you're rooting for. But a lot of people like us who are playing, we're rooting for one player and rooting against another player. And it just makes it so stressful on Sunday, too. A lot of this with fantasy, you're trying to win. It's a close game. You keep refreshing. I don't really feel that pressure on Saturday. So I think it is more fun. And because I'm able to root for the team and the school that I went to, uh, that, that sort of pounds at home. I'm a, I'm a graduate of the University of Florida, and I can root for the Gators. And, and maybe this season will be fun for the Gators. I don't know. But uh, I do tend to like it. And the other part about Saturdays, too, Davis, is I can poke in and out on these games, man. Like the NFL, I feel yes. like once I am down at 1 o'clock, I am down until 8 o'clock. Like, that's it. Like, I am just moving to get up, get something to eat, and that's it. Saturdays, I'm like, I'm in. I'm outside. I'm going to play, you know, a Little League baseball, going to do something. And I feel like I can pop back in and out, and there's no pressure. So Saturdays to me are more fun. Once it gets to Sunday, it's very tense for me. So I'll say it is more fun. 
on Saturday. All right, uh, boy, last week we were here on the show talking about the National League East, and has the landscape changed completely in a week? Oh, I would say so. Uh, Phillies are on on a, on, a, on a streak now where it looks like they've just put themselves out of contention in the NL East, so we don't have to talk about them at all. And the Atlanta Braves, all of a sudden, Davis, they were three and a half back. Now it's just one. And it's not like the Mets are really playing bad baseball. It's just that the Braves are playing this epic baseball this season. And they are coming on strong just like they did last year. Fantasy or reality, though, the New York Mets, Davis, will win the National League East. Fantasy or reality? You know what? I mean, I just, I want, I want Brent Levy to be happy. I want our producer to be in a good spot. So I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say reality here. And like, you know, the Mets are, are pretty incredible this season. I mean, you know, they, they don't have, uh, you know, the, they don't have the cover boy in New York, you know, they don't have anyone hitting 50 home runs or, or whatever, but they've gotten, uh, by the way, remember when we were just like Francisco Lindor, this is the worst contract. This guy stinks. Like, he has totally figured it out. 350 OBP, 21 home runs, 15 steals. And it just also it feels like the Mets have contributors that can come in at any point. Like, oh, you know, this guy's, uh, you know, we have Jeff McNeil struggling. So uh, Louis Guillerme is going to come in and be like a, an all-star level utility man or whatever. And then also they are really, you know, kind of getting the best of their pitching now. Now Scherzer... That, that is a little bit of a worry, right? He left the start the other day with mm-hmm. 64 starting pitches, but he said it was just like a minor oblique thing. So they have DeGrom back going healthy. Chris Bassett has been phenomenal. They have Scherzer, who theoretically you know, should be able to – I believe he scheduled the pitch on Saturday. Even Taiwan Walker has honestly been fine. Edmund Diaz, this amazing closer. Like I, I got reality. The Mets are just getting after it. Yeah, I got I got fantasy, man. I got fantasy. The Braves are just unbeatable right now. Boy, the Mets are going to have to take... I think they have six games left against them or three. I'm not sure which one it is. I know they play again. It is going to come down to these head-to-head games, I think, between these two teams. And, and Davis, the second year in a row, the Braves at the deadline, what do they do? This year, everyone is saying, oh, well, Alex Anthopoulos, he didn't make any acquisitions. All he did is Robbie Grossman. They called this kid Ron Grissom. They call up this kid, Michael Harris. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you even explain this? I mean, it's unbelievable. They didn't even have to do anything. And then they and then they take Spencer Strider from the eighth inning and make him a starter. And this dude is striking out 16 guys a game. They haven't even got Michael Soroka back. He's coming back to pitch for them. I don't know, man. I think, and they got Kenley in the ninth too. I mean, not as good as Edwin Diaz, by you know, let's, let's not get it twisted. But I don't know. I think, the Braves are, I think the Braves are winning the East. I do. I think they're winning it. Now, in a seven-game series or, or something like that, when these two teams play in the playoffs, hey, Mets could easily win this thing. But the, but Atlanta is just scorching hot right now. They're fully healthy. Everybody's playing great for them. And these two kids are leading the way in Harris and Grissom. Unbelievable that, that they keep pulling this off every year. What an organization. Fantastic job. All right, so I got the Braves there. Now, this one, again, we don't really get into a ton of salaciousness here on the show, but I think we got to do this one. Because I think if you were on anywhere on social media – on Sunday or late Saturday night, then you saw this story and we got to do it. We got to take care of this one here. Now there's some backstory here naturally to this, which is that look, it, it's pretty obvious at this point that Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, uh, well, they, they, when they're together, it's, it seems like everything is fine. They, they're probably not the closest in terms of having relationships here. I mean, you know, maybe Pippen a little jealous of Jordan, Jordan may be a little jealous that you know, that the Pippen had such a big impact. I, I don't really know. If you watch The Last Dance, you saw some of this come out too. But to think that this is a possibility blows my mind, Davis. TMZ posted this story that happened in my neck of the woods, about 20 minutes south of here in Miami, that Larsa Pippen, the ex-wife of Scotty Pippen, was out, definitely out at some point somewhere in Miami to a dinner with the son of the son of Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan's grown son, 32 years old, Larsa Pippen pushing 50 years old, by the way, too. Oh my gosh, Davis, fantasy or reality, you believe this TMZ report that Michael Jordan's son was on a date with Scottie Pippen's ex-wife, fantasy or reality? I mean, I I hope it's true. Like, I I, I think that's where I would stand because I think it's funny. But Craig, this is is even more funny. Like the... uh, 
the extra layer of this is that this is not the first time that someone in the Pippin universe would have gotten involved in a in a salacious thing that made its way to the TMZ headlines because apparently, according to reports, uh, that uh, rapper Future, who of course fathered a child with Russell Wilson's now wife, Sierra, apparently, according to reports, what happened was that uh, at some point, Future also went on a date and was romantically involved with this same woman. So feels like maybe this woman just kind of really has it out for Scotty. It just it's like something something is going on there. Pippin is, uh, you know, the people in his life are are not looking out for him. But I, I, I I'll say reality. I believe it. Yeah, this, this is this is pretty crazy. Now, uh, I do have a little bit of background here uh, in, in having been to the same. I mean, I don't know how I would put this. Uh, my wife and I once went to a party uh, in in Florida where uh, the Pippins were there. Larsa Pippin was there, and 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 all of this stuff. Larsa Pippin's also on one of the Housewives shows as well. I think the line that you're going down, Davis, or the road you're going down, I, I feel like it's somewhat accurate here, but it does feel a little insane. Like this does feel like I want this to be fantasy. You know, now Michael Jordan's got to be sitting back laughing at this whole thing. I, I'm guessing. But, but I mean, I'm looking at this, Davis, and, and some of the stories that, that have been portrayed here with this and this divorce that happened. But, I mean, you, I mean, Larsa Pippen, regardless, you know, is still fairly attractive, even though she's pushing 50. I mean, she could have her choice, I would guess, of a lot of others. Why choose Michael Jordan's son, of all people? My gosh, what are you doing here? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to say I, I don't believe it. I'm going to say fantasy. I, I think some – I think, Davis, my, my take here – is somebody tipped off TMZ? Uh, Lars Pippen had somebody tip him off. Say, hey, let's let's you totally. know, go with me to lunch. Let's take a picture here, and this is just going to piss my ex husband off. I, I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that is the case because if it is reality, this is this is wow. I, I don't know, Davis. You don't cross this line, man. I don't know. It's going too far. I mean, it, it that's totally what it feels. It just that's totally what it feels like to me is that it's purposeful line crossing, right? It's got to be like she, it just clearly has to be. This woman being like Scotty, like I, I've, I, I'm mad at you. You know, it's it's clear it's done in an intentional way because there's no other reason to go on a date with with Michael Jordan's kid. You know, I mean, he's a grown man now at this point too, but still, you know, 20 years older than him. Yikes! Okay, <laughs> that's our fantasy reality for the day. We'll keep it uh, straighter tomorrow here on the show. Had to do this one today here after I saw that one over the weekend for sure. All right, we will take a quick break here on the program. When we come back next, it's time for the Sports Grid 60. I'll be back with you at 2 o'clock Eastern here for another edition of Newswire and our buddy from the weekend show and the NFL, uh, Mike Blewett, covering pro football today. Going to cover the first week of the NFL with us. That's 2 o'clock Eastern right here on Sports Grid on Newswire. So make sure you stay tuned uh, to that show as well. Davis and I will be back tomorrow. We'll have our final fantasy football previews. We'll take care of the New York Giants and New York Jets. And then on Thursday, Davis and I will give a full preview of Thursday night's DFS action for the opening night of the NFL. We'll go in. But I think truly this is where we're going to find out whether Tua is the guy in Miami. And obviously there's a guy named Lamar Jackson that's sort of now waiting in the wings to be a free agent in a couple of weeks. As bizarre as it was, it was Superman realizing that he's Clark Kent and he walks the earth with, earth with other humans. So um, I don't make too much of it. I think Anthony Joshua now has to embark on a new path for his career. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. The early line. We might have thought Donovan Mitchell was headed to New York, but he's headed to Cleveland. A stunning move because it felt like the Knicks were the front runners with a lot of distance here. We found out some really interesting aspects of the Knicks Jazz deal, but really the most pressing thing is what does this mean for Cleveland? And it now is a team that has a completely different ceiling than they did before. Only on Sports Grid. 
Farrell, coast to coast. Big Ten, Ohio State's the favorite as we start the season, minus 225. Michigan, 6-1, to one. and then there goes everybody else. Ohio State doesn't play anyone. It's already over. Ohio State's schedule is so easy. It's the teams that schedule all their non-conference games with nobodies that really gets me going. At least like they're Michigan. playing Notre Dame. I'll, like Michigan. The Sports Grid Network. If Clemson wins the ACC once again with only a single loss on the record, I guarantee you the Clemson Tigers will be a member of the college football playoff this year. Right, taking the over on that one, to be quite honest with you, there's a lot of questions in Houston that they're still trying to figure out. It's a young team, and I think it's going to be kind of an up and down year for them. The morning after, only on Sports Grid. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions. Only on Sports Grid. Early line is straight ahead, less than five minutes from now. They got you till two o'clock Eastern. Then I'm back here on another edition of Newswire. I will hope to see you then. Let's wrap up the show today as we turn it over to Davis. He's got our Sports Grid at 60 for Monday. We're right about the point of the season, Craig, where... We're going to start being wrong about things. You know, up until this point, we can we can project, we can wish cast, and be like, oh, I think this guy's going to be good. I think that guy's going to be good. I think that guy's going to be bad. That team's going to be good. That team's going to be bad. And, you know, we can, we can feel pretty confident. And uh, we're going to be back here a week from now, Tuesday next week, and we'll be like, oof, we were wrong about that. We were wrong about that. Oh, we were really wrong about that. This guy I liked got hurt. This guy I like was, you know, and and I think it's very important to have strong opinions weekly held right now because if you are too married to your preseason ideas on teams and players, it is going to be a long year of, uh, you know, playing daily fantasy, managing our season along teams and betting. So uh, just, a, just a reminder to really update with new information. Fair enough. I'll tell you an interesting dynamic for me going into now another week of college football has been uh, watching the Gators play on Saturday night and watching this incredible quarterback that the Gators have named Anthony Richardson. It's a different feeling of Gators football this season and, and a feeling when you have one of the best quarterbacks in college football, it's sort of almost, look, you want your team to win no matter what, but you have this element of watching as to whether or not the game, they win or lose. I mean, there's a, a degree of it that really doesn't matter because you're watching one of the best players play for your college football team, which definitely is the case for Richardson at Florida. Is he a Heisman Trophy candidate? I mean, he moved up significantly in terms of odds. Are the Gators a top 25 team? I don't know. They weren't ranked a week ago. Now, all of a sudden, they're in the top 20. We will see. But one player can change everything on college football, and Richardson looks like he may do that for Florida. That'll do it for the show today. Thanks, of course, to LTN and, of course, our producer, Brett Levy. For my co-host, Davis Maddock, and Craig Mish, I hope you have a great day. Great, great.